Welcome to the Geek to Geek podcast, where we have listeners. You guys actually responded, and you blew us away, and it's amazing. So you get your own episode. I'm Void, and I'm here with my co-host, Beige. And they'll blow us all the way. That was my Hamilton, and I'm so sorry. Like, I just, I, I can't, I, I can't take that back, and I'm so sorry. Today, we're talking about Final Fantasy still. This is our third part. Next week, we'll get on to another topic, I promise. But... In our first part, we asked you guys for thoughts, feedback, questions for us, and you sent it, and we got more than we thought we would, so we put it into its own episode, which is what you're listening to right now. So yeah, we're going to get into listener feedback, basically. Let's get started. All of these are from Twitter. Um, I did check the email account, but everyone, we're very active on Twitter. So Gold you star all, for you. Yeah, gold stars. You guys apparently figured that out because that's where we talk to all of you. So at Chocoba Chica on Twitter, she was one of the only ones to hit us up with some thoughts that weren't just straight up questions. So first of all, I'm going to read through her thoughts really quick. She says, six needs a remake, most of all. Nine is the best Agreed. Final Fantasy. I've read the Squall is Dead theory, and it's neat. The Necron Tree of Life theory for nine is a good read also. And she thinks that basically her and I have the exact same opinions about all the games, which talking to her on Twitter, I'm pretty sure that's true, too. And Mm -hmm, then she also said it's kind of strange that Final Fantasy 14 has blown her away. And it's it's awesome. It's way higher on her series ranking than she thought it would be. So her thinking lines up almost exactly with mine, guys, which is just amazing. Um, So those were her thoughts. She did send us some questions. She wanted to know, are we interested in World of Final Fantasy? I don't know what that is. Okay, so it's basically, it's coming out here in the next month or two. I think it's out in October. And it's this like chibi version of Final Fantasy characters in a new story. So it's one where it's trying to be an actual RPG with two new main characters. But it looks like they summon or they have like um, team members who are these little chibi versions of like all of our old Final Fantasy characters. So I'm sure Lightning and Cloud and Squall and all the people we know. I see Cloud right now. Yep. Yeah, that's what it is. So apparently you aren't interested because you didn't even know it existed. I didn't know, but I'm I'm looking like I'm interested now based on what I'm seeing. So Um, for me, I'm going to wait until the reviews come out. It's on my radar. Yeah. And if the reviews come out and it's not horrible, I will grab it. If the reviews come out and it is horrible, I will eventually pick it up sometime when it's cheaper because I want to experience every Final Fantasy game, even if I don't beat everyone. Um, eventually, I'll get around to it. It just depends on how well it gets reviewed and what they have to say about it when it comes out. Um, Chocobachika's other question, have you ever played the rhythm games? She says that she loves theater rhythm. I think it's actually pronounced theater rhythm. I've never said that out loud before, even though I've read it many times. I always think of theater rhythm, but that doesn't make yeah. any sense either. Something like know. that. But she also loves music games. So for me, I I actually really like theater rhythm. Um, I've bought it on two different platforms, two different versions of it. Yeah, I, I had fun with it. I think I played it on, I'm trying to remember now. I want to say I played it on my phone for a while. And then I picked up, there was like a complete version or something on the 3DS. And I like that one even better with physical buttons. But yeah, I mean, the Final Fantasy music is great. So the fact that they made it into a rhythm game, it it actually works really well. And I haven't bothered to play them because I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I don't necessarily care about music. I don't particularly like a lot of music that I tend to sit in silence most of the time and keep volume down on games and things like that where music is cool and all. And I love Hamilton. I mean, and things like that, when it really catches my attention, it catches my attention. But I don't really like rhythm games. I have zero rhythm and I just can't I can't hear melody. I don't think like at my wedding, we had a violinist playing Fly Me to the Moon as our recessional. And when we got out away from everyone and we got back behind the curtains and everything, I looked at Jennifer and I said, did she, you know, I thought she was supposed to play Fly Me to the Moon. I was like, and Jennifer was like, she did. And I was like, (laughs) no, she didn't. That was something, but it wasn't Fly Me to the Moon. So when it comes to rhythm games, I've just avoided theater rhythm because of it, because I have, it's not going to be my kind of game. Okay. It, It was for me. I mean, I bought it twice. So obviously I liked what it had to offer. Um, Capsule J on Twitter, who's another frequent listener and frequent commenter, keep commenting. We love it. 
Uh, yes. He said, so he also left comments. He said, I think it's a he. I guess I've never asked. Capsule J said, the previous episode was a great accompaniment while farming for Deathbringer swords in Final Fantasy XII. So good luck on your Final Fantasy XII playthrough, by the way. Uh, the question they put in front of us, what are your thoughts on side quests, optional bosses, and mini games in Final Fantasy? Do you dig into uh, them? Do you skip them? Do you have a favorite one? Oh, man. I love side quests and mini games. Like there are some of them that that I absolutely hate. Like I really, really despise Blitzball and Ten and optional bosses. I will give a couple of tries to, and if they are just absurdly powerful, like most of them are, I end up never beating them. Like the weapons in Final Fantasy VII, I never bother with going through and doing them. But side quests, I want to know pretty much as much as I can about the story and characters as I can. I go through side quests as I find them and hope I find others. Okay, so for me, well, let me answer the side quest question first, but then I have a bigger thought that goes with this. So any side quest that actually fleshes out characters' backstories, especially if they're your companion characters. Oh, yeah. Or side quests that actually give you more companion characters. Those I really enjoy. I really like. Mm -hmm. And the the one i always think of that's a prime example for me is mass effect 2 if you've never played mass effect 2 basically every single side quest in that game ties into your character somehow and every character has like a main side quest line that you can go down that really gives you a ton of character development and that's why mass effect 2 is my favorite in the series i know we're not talking about mass effect the series today but Mass Effect 2 is fantastic because of those character side quests. So anytime I can get those character like side quests, I really like to dig into those. The bigger thought I wanted to get into is how I actually play these games. And uh, me and Capsule J were talking about this the (laughs) other day. So we were talking about grinding, exploring, um, leveling up, you know, side quests, optional, kind of along these same lines. And I realized that I always play these the same way. And I just had never put it into words before. So... I basically spend the first third to a half of a game, if it's a giant RPG like this, um, grinding, exploring, over-leveling, and figuring out ways to break the systems in the game. I've talked before about how I like to break a game, if I can, and figure out ways to exploit the systems in place without actually cheating, but working within the system to like accomplish things that are really interesting or game-breaking. I will spend the first third to half of a game doing that, and then I'll get to the point where I'm like, I've broken this game. I've done the side quests I want. I'm going critical path. And the second half of the game, I will do nothing except the main storyline to the exclusion of all else. Like I just ignore everything else and I just go, okay, I'm ready. I've I've beaten this game. I know the systems. I'm going to finish it now. And I will plow through the back half of the game. And I almost always do that with any RPG but especially with Final Fantasy. See, I should probably do what you do, but I do the exact opposite of that. I rush through the first half of the game that I just want to absorb as much of the story as I possibly can, and then I'm usually underleveled by the time I get to the second half of it, and I have to go grind to beat the final boss, let's say, and... For a long time, I hadn't beat Final Fantasy X because I simply wasn't powerful enough, and I hate grinding. I absolutely hate grinding. I hate fighting and doing that for no other purpose than for fighting and grinding, so I put it down for a very, very long time before I went back and actually beat it. And that's one of the things that I just can't bring myself to do in new areas and fight. Though in Final Fantasy IX, I find myself doing it kind of like you suggested. When I get to a new area, I run around and level up a couple of times. And that's made my game a little bit better than it was the last couple of times I've played JRPGs. Yeah, I will typically do one giant grinding session like over a night or two once I'm far enough into the game that I can get some decent experience and I'll get ahead of the level curve. And once you're ahead of the level curve by a few levels, it doesn't even have to be that much. You can basically stay ahead of the level curve the whole game and never have to worry about it again. And that's that's what I like. I like just being slightly ahead of where you need to be in levels because then you can stop thinking about it and just enjoy the rest of the game without having to be like, oh, am I strong enough? Is this boss going to kill me? How many times do I have to try this boss? It's probably why my playthrough times on Final Fantasies are shorter than most of the ones that I look up on how long to beat. I think most of the Final Fantasy games took me 20 to 25 hours. 
and I regularly see people who say that a lot of the ones I beat in that time take them 40 to 60 hours. Oh, yeah, that makes true, because I'm about like 22 hours in Final Fantasy IX, and I'm on disc three of four. Yeah, I think I beat that one around 25. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's kind of how I play RPGs, and now you guys know. I'm sure I'll come up again now that I've put it into words. Now that I'm thinking about it, the next time I play one, I'll keep it in mind. I wanted to talk about the mini games for just a second because in Final Fantasy IX, there's a card game called Tetra Master, and this is my favorite mini game of any of the Final Fantasy games. And it is for the most part optional. There are only well, there's only one time that I can remember that is absolutely required that you play it. And I love this so much. And my friends at work love this so much that Austin and Barry and Michael and I all made our own Tetra Master game so that we could play. We we printed out our own cards. We double sided them. We put triangles on them. Div- made our own game boards. Blocked off uh, individual set spaces for each game randomly and took turns blocking them off. We had our own tournaments and took cards from each other and we did this in real life by making our own Tetra Master and I just have to say how much fun that was that if you guys ever want some kind of fun to do make your own Final Fantasy mini game in real life that that we were big enough nerds that we would just get a table and play a game or two and then uh, just taking breaks Wow, that's dedication. I haven't yeah. found any of the Final Fantasy mini games that interesting to the point where I would go that <laughs> far Um <laughs> But that's cool. That's cool that you did that. I actually chocobo breeding. Just you know, just put a coop up in your backyard. Oh, you yeah, know, no you get some eggs. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so Jennifer and Jeff from the Kid Free Weekend podcast, and they also have another podcast called Pod of Thrones, which is good. If you guys haven't listened to either of those, check them out. I don't know which one of them was writing because they have a shared Twitter account. I'm just gonna say they. So their comment is that they played a lot of Final Fantasy XI and loved the character customiz- customization. Um, And then as far as questions, I'm reading here. I want to hear more about Final Fantasy V as I ease into a very long gaming to-do list. If you can really play through the game with any combination of classes, that's amazeballs and totally up my alley. I love trying weird combos, but too many games punish people for that effort. So, yes. I mean, the answer is yes. You totally can do this. Mm -hmm, Completely. I mentioned it two weeks ago when we were talking episode by episode the fact that the four job fiesta exists for this game shows that it's possible because people do it with literally every combination of jobs out there it is possible to beat the game with that's kind of going to the insane level is where you only get four jobs out of all the possible ones and you're stuck with those like that's not how you are going to play the game the first time so You should probably understand kind of how the job system unwinds itself. Basically, you unlock jobs as you encounter crystals throughout the game. And this goes on for the first like third to half of the game. You're slowly unlocking more and more jobs. So every time you hit a new crystal, you usually get something like four jobs. Some of them have more and some of them have less, if I remember, just depending on like where you are in the game. And you basically get to the point where after the first third or half of the game, you have all of the jobs available to you. From that point... It's basically just you getting to mix and match them and play with them and figure out what works for you. The other thing with this is you can add abilities that you've learned from other jobs. So if you've gotten a job to a high enough level, so I'll give you an actual example to make it easier. Let's say you pick up Black Mage for one of your main characters right away in the game and you max that black mage out you wouldn't have to let's say you go up to level like four or five and then you get to a point in the game where oh suddenly you want them to be like a beast master you switch them to beast master but because you already had like four of these job levels in black mage you can assign black magic as like a sub ability you can only pick one from one other class but you'll have the ability up to the job level that you got So you basically have a main class and then you have a secondary class that you can use one of their skills and assign it in under that. So it really lets you mix and match your classes in Final Fantasy V, which is another reason why the four job fiesta is very possible. And that's a kind of a way that they do it in Final Fantasy XIV, where you get one one ability or a series of abilities from a different class that you bring in uh, with certain other classes as well. Like White Mage can get something from all of the other caster classes and vice versa i like that a lot but i like that in five as well that you can beat pretty much anything you know going back to the four job fiesta thinking about that can you beat it with four berserkers yes 
Yes, wow. you can. It's possible. It's like the hardest thing to do in the game, but you can do it. That is just crazy to me to even think about how that would even be possible. Just pretty much yeah. random luck. Yep. I mean, you just have to grind it out. There are certain combinations of classes and jobs where you will have to do a lot of grinding. And there are other ones where you don't have to do barely any at all. It depends on luck of the draw and what you get. But yeah, berserkers are possible. People do it every year, even though it's insane. Um, that is insane. Their other follow up question was, do any other Final Fantasy games have the sub job system? Uh, they truly love that about Final Fantasy XI. So I actually had to follow up and ask, what is the sub-job system? So they said it was, the, to the best of my ability, because like I haven't played XI, as I've told you guys, I hate that one, but that's just me. They, it, was, it sounded like it was kind of like dual classing. So some of them have what I was talking about with Final Fantasy V, where you have a main job, right. and if you've mastered other abilities out of other jobs, you can kind of assign a few of them, which is kind of like a dual class, kind of like a subclass. You have Final Fantasy XIV, which Bees just mentioned. You have, you know, you can assign some parts of other jobs, and you can switch between jobs, which is cool. A lot of the games let you kind of make your own class, even though they aren't necessarily a class. Mm -hmm. So I would say Final Fantasy II... Final Fantasy 7, Final Fantasy 8, Final Fantasy 10, and Final Fantasy 12. 12. All give you freedom with your characters. They all start at a particular place and are maybe good at something initially, but you can take them and you can develop them any way you want, which is really cool. The one that's more directly related to this would be dual classing in other forms. So like I said, Final Fantasy 5 and 14, we talked about those. But also Final Fantasy X-2, where you have multiple jobs. The jobs act as like dress spheres, so they dress up your characters, but they literally change the job when you change to mm -hmm. that outfit. And you place those on a board, and then in the middle of the battle, you can move from any spot on the board to any spot adjacent to it. So essentially you have a bunch of jobs that you can move around between in the middle of battle. And it's really cool. You like it this one, very, right? You've played it that. It is very, very cool. Yeah, that is by far the best thing about Final Fantasy X-2, that that job system is every bit a sequel to Final Fantasy V. Like, they directly followed up and made it better. Yeah, At least then, I think that. They did. And then um, I mentioned it the other week, but Bravely Default is a fantastic one in this. It's a straight up evolution from Final Fantasy V. And I would also say Final Fantasy XIII falls in here. Yeah. Because every every character has like multiple roles and you can yeah. switch between different combinations of roles in the middle of battle, which is kind of the core of the thirteen battle system. Yeah, because if you need a healer, you can switch to a support class, but all of a sudden, if you just, you know, they're doing absolutely nothing and you need them to pull out some damage, you just swap and tell them and they start using their, their attacking abilities. The same for the Sentinel job, I believe it's called, where you switch and they start casting Protect and Shell and doing things like that and covering other members of the party to protect them. Yep, yep, absolutely. So... Uh, another question that kind of ties into some of this was from Pam, who's at Jisla. Oh, I've never actually said this word out loud. I read it all the time on Twitter. I Jisla? talk to you. Jisla? I say Jisla in my head. Sure. It's, yeah. I, I should actually ask her how to pronounce it. Anyway, um, she's from the Media Mavens podcast, which if you haven't listened to is another great podcast to check out. She said that she'd like to hear more about the best Final Fantasy, in her opinion, Final Fantasy X-2. How do you feel about it as both its own game with new mechanics and as a follow-up to the more somber story of 10. So for me, in terms of like the story following up, it doesn't work as well because it has such a different tone to the game. It's all about Yuna and these two girls as kind of like a pop star sensation. It's, it's too girly, but it's not because I don't like girls. It's because they took <laughs> all of the stereotypical girly things and they took them to an extreme and that's what they made the game into. And it doesn't quite work for me in terms of tone. But I think that this, the dress sphere system that we were just talking about is actually really, really good. Um, I think the gameplay is good. The battle system is solid. The progression system is interesting. And I think I mentioned this last episode, but I like the true ending to 10 2 because it ties back into the story, that somber story from Final Fantasy X. And it actually adds to the very end of it. And I like that a lot. 
And I really like the individual like stories that are being told through the mission system as opposed to the overall. I like being able to say, I've completed this area and I'm moving on. I am moving. I'm going to be able to play through this part of the game. And then if I don't want to play again for a while, I feel as though I've completed something because it is a mission based system where you're continually completing small goals toward a larger one. And I really liked that when I went through the main thing I didn't like about it in terms of just gameplay was I didn't like not having a world map that that one I didn't I just jumping around like that I missed exploring yeah but I, I mean, love the battle system yeah that exploring thing is it's basically exactly the same as 10 you know yep, except I had that problem with 10 okay and same thing um Zach Pylons on Twitter who is another frequent listener um gave us a couple questions he wants to know, what are your favorite and least favorite Final Fantasy spinoff games? So for me, my favorite Final Fantasy spinoff, um, it would probably have to be Tactics Advance or Tactics Advance 2. I, I don't remember both of them as much as I should, so I'm not sure which one of those takes the lead, but I like those two a lot. And then my least favorite, there are very many to choose from that are not good. But <laughs> yeah. I would have to say probably one of the mobile titles, maybe even the latest one, that Justice Monsters 5 is just horrible, horrible, horrible. It's got to be one of the really bad mobile free-to-play titles is my least favorite. Yeah, I could see that. And rather than, you know... I don't I'm not even considering Justice Monsters 5 like a spin-off in in this terms because it is just it is garbage. It is not worth the space in Apple's database that it takes up. So I would say the worst for me would probably be something like Final Fantasy Mystic Quest that is just an absolute insult to RPG players because it was designed for Americans. I believe, if I'm remembering this right, so somebody's probably going to send me an email and tell me I'm wrong, but if I remember right, this one was designed specifically for Americans because we couldn't handle the hard Final Fantasies that they gave us Mystic Quest. And if you've ever played it, it feels like a preschool version of Final Fantasy, like when you look at like Imagine X and then typical, you know, action figures, that's kind of the way that Mystic Quest plays to the traditional Final Fantasies. And it's one of my absolute least favorite ones of the spinoffs. In terms of the absolute favorite ones, I mean, Kingdom Hearts by far. Kingdom Hearts is my favorite one of the spinoffs. I spent more time with it than I have any of them. It It's so different, but I love seeing all of those characters that I have fallen in love with over the years in, in one single game interacting with each other because it's the only game I'm going to see Squall interacting with Eris. And I get to see, you know, I completely can't remember. I'm thinking of all of them in like, uh, not Hollow Bastion, but uh, Traverse Town and all of this. <laughs> and, and I can just see them, but I I can't think of their names, but I love Kingdom Hearts. Like, that's my favorite of them. Cool. Yeah, I would probably actually throw Bravely Default in here as one of my favorites if we're getting, you know, one step beyond in terms of spinoffs. Bravely Default was really good. Um, yeah. Another question from him. Do you think the Final Fantasy 15 team has been showing off too much of the game, or do you think it's good that they've been so open? So, I don't know how I feel about this one. I think it's fine because you can choose not to watch it. I've purposefully chosen not to watch a lot of what they've put out because I don't want to spoil myself. I want to just judge the game when I get it on the day that it comes out because I know I'm getting it on release day. Um, it's probably good for people who aren't sure because they can really dig into it and make up their mind ahead of time. And maybe, maybe it's good that they're being open so that they actually get the game done. I mean, this game has been <laughs> in development true. for 10 years. Like, seriously. It's been out for a long time. It, it needs to release soon. It does. And for me, I haven't been paying attention to it either. I have pretty much cut myself off from gameplay videos and a lot of the developer interviews at this point because I'm actually looking forward to the game now. And I think that they have to know what they're doing, that they've been doing this for a long time. And like you said, not, not even just developing this game, just being in this industry for a long time. I wonder if they're actually showing us a lot of the game that they've talked about how the game tightens up in the second half and the open world stuff really goes in and, and becomes a little more linear and traditional Final Fantasy. 
I wonder how much it's going to change at that point because we've seen a lot of the open world. Like we know how that's going, especially when they do this world of EOS video that they did that takes you on a tour. But we have no idea how the actual like second half is going to go. And I really, really wonder if they're like, they're going to surprise us somehow with this and it's all going to completely change from what we expect. Well, and everything I've heard is that they've really only showed off like chapter one of the game. Right. And they've showed off different vertical slices of it. And then they've let a couple like sets of game journalists actually play through it entirely. But I don't think that they've actually let people get beyond that initial first few hours of the game. So I I think there's a lot to look forward to and a lot we don't know about. Um, The last question from Zach, how do you feel about the sudden oversaturation of Final Fantasy mobile titles? So not ports. But the games like Mobius, Record Keeper, Bravely Exvius, I would add on games like the one we were just talking about, Justice, Justice Monsters, Monsters 5. Justice Monsters 5. Um, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, keep, I hate them. I keep waiting for a Final Fantasy mobile title that is a full game without all these free-to-play mechanics attached to it. Final would, Fantasy Dimensions. Yeah, it's That is a freshman effort at mobile game design and if you play it you will quickly see that like oh it it very much is but at least it's it is a full game that doesn't do the tap 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 give me money yeah yeah it's so it's slightly better but i think that with everything they've learned from developing for mobile now they need to come back and they're not going to do this like this is me dreaming guys i want them to come back make a title from the ground up that is a full game that you buy once on mobile design it for the phone get rid of all of the energy mechanics all the free-to-play stuff all of the you know gotcha pawn like drawing lucky things and doing once a day like i don't i don't care about any of that like give me a real game that i can give you five or ten dollars for that's final fantasy i will buy it i will buy it yeah straight up but i will not play things like record keeper and things like that anymore it's just it's they're wastes of time where i don't get anything out of it i will play them for one day I will play them for yeah. one day because I, I hold out hope that maybe someday they will put a good one out there, but they haven't yet. Like, I put it, play it for one day. I delete it from my phone forever. That's what happened last week with Justice Monsters 5. Um, yep. So, Bear Mine on Twitter asks, how do I find the fun? All of these games are just too long. Um, My wife says that, too. Maybe they're not for you is my initial reaction what do you think i pretty much say the same thing like if you don't like the narrative then they're probably not for you because if you do like the narrative then you're going to to be invested and want to put in those hours and if you're like my wife and it's the turn-based selecting your actions from a menu battles there's not a lot that's going to that's going to get you in and deal with that for that long 15 might with its action system and 12 might i don't know they may just not be for you i mean if you don't like long games then the awful mobile ones no no don't do that no don't do that no i think it just might not be a series for you and that's okay i mean you know it doesn't click with everyone just because it's huge and we love it doesn't mean that everyone has to love it i'm sure there are people listening who just love dragon quest and we just can't get into it yeah, or games like like the Metal Gear series. Like I've wanted yeah. to love the last few and I fell out of that series a long time ago. But I, I know it's huge. I know that people love it. I understand why, but it's not a series for me, you know? Well, also and, same with Uncharted, like you mentioned last week. People just absolutely adore it. We've tried and we're just like, nope, this isn't the kind of game that we like. And I'm happy that other people have so much fun with them. But I mean, maybe you just don't play Final Fantasy games. Maybe find a shorter RPG or an action RPG. Maybe Maybe Diablo or that kind of RPG that you can play that you can play just sitting down for a shorter period of time would be better. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just tap out and be done with Final Fantasy. That's it's OK. It's OK. Um, Mikey 12 says, can a great Final Fantasy exist on modern consoles or do limitations help the franchise? So, I love this question. I do, too. I think limitations help the franchise. Yes. And I don't think that Square Enix has actually. Well, I should say I don't think the people in charge of the Final Fantasy games have actually caught up to modern game development because it's taking them so long to make this adjustment to HD. We saw it with the release of 13 and how long it actually took to get 13 out the door. And then 
they were so hamstrung by that development that instead of move on to the next game, they made sequel after sequel. Like they made 13-2, they made Lightning Returns all in the same engine because they were like, hey, we finally figured out an HD engine that works. Let's milk it for literally everything it's worth. Well, the same thing with 15 when it was, what was it, versus 13 or something along the lines that started its development as one of the 13 games? It was announced at the same time that Final Fantasy 13 was as part of the, if I'm Nova remembering Crystalis? it right, it's Fabula Novel Crystal like okay yeah it's something like that it was a big overarching like branching narrative structure or like uh, you know pantheon of gods or it was something that was going to tie all these games together and it was actually called versus 13 or 13 verses it was supposed to come out very soon after 13 and then 13 got delayed and delayed and delayed and we never really heard about it again until a couple years ago where it cropped back up and they said oh yeah this is final fantasy 15 now like it's been in development for 10 yep. years. They just they don't have their stuff together yet. And I think that the limitations that other consoles let them that they put on them, let them just straight up tell a story as opposed to worrying about things like HD and getting the battle systems and things like that looking so perfect that they push the technology for what it could do and they found those limitations more easily. Like Final Fantasy IX, you look at it compared to even eight, and you see that they have done a lot of pushing the PlayStation 1 to its very limit that it could do. And then you look at 15 versus 13, and yeah, it's a an upgrade, but it's not really honestly any better than other PlayStation 4 and Xbox One games. At this point, they're they're not reaching the limitations. And I think you said it right when they focus too much on playing catch up that they're just not doing anything new. I don't think that they've I don't think they're able to right now. And well, and part of the problem is they always want to be an industry leader in graphics. And the time for that has passed. Like there was a time where they did it and it worked really well with their games and it blew people away. But we're not there anymore. Like, mm. you know, photorealism. That's true. Realism, yeah, photorealism doesn't phase us. We just go, oh, yeah, cool. Like, that's it. That's, you know, when I see graphics that look like real life, I'm like, oh, yeah, sweet. And then I move on. Like, it, it doesn't blow you away anymore. We're past that point with video games. They shouldn't worry so much about it, but they do. I mean, that was one of the things that notoriously bombed Final Fantasy XIV, the original one, not mm-hmm. A Realm Reborn, is that they spent so much time on the graphics and not enough time on the gameplay. And there were stories about how I, I remember reading <laughs> I know one what of the you're stories talk about too. that there was like a potted plant yep. that had as many polygons in it as a player character model. Yep. And it's just you don't need that in an MMO. You don't need that in any game, really. Like, you know, they get so hung up on graphics that I think modern consoles have freed them up to focus on it even more, and it's to the series' detriment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm hoping that they come back around and realize that that what made the Final Fantasy series popular to begin with was the the gameplay and drawing people in and i i'm really hopeful for 15 and i'm afraid i'm gonna get burned but i'm really hopeful that they've that this one has been in development long enough that we're gonna see the while they haven't hit the limitations that they may have been able to do it with storytelling again because kingsglaive really pushed me into that area and if you really want to feel frustrated like I do, go back and refresh your memory about how fast Final Fantasy 7, 8, 9, and 10 came out. Like, those yeah. games were almost back to back year after year. And they were all good and they all improved on the one before it and they all got better game after game. And they were just pumping them out and they were fantastic. It was when they finally made that jump up to the next system. You know, even Final Fantasy 12 came out pretty soon after 10 and there was yep. a whole MMO in between there. But there was a time where they were announcing two Final Fantasies at once, you know? If we were still in that era, we would know what Final Fantasy 15 is and we would already have a good idea about what 16 is because it would be in development mm-hmm. and like, you know, a year away from releasing. They're just not there anymore and it's frustrating. And the game industry has changed. We're looking at DLCs now. There's going to be DLC for 15 and we're looking at how that's going to play play out and honestly i think that when 
when Square merged with Enix, that that's when they went downhill. That that this is a this is just my opinion on it, but that's when I think the games started feeling less like the traditional SquareSoft games, and they started pandering more to the. I don't want to say pandering more to the mainstream. That's not necessarily what I mean. But they started looking toward what was industry standard as opposed to trying to experiment and do other things. Yeah. And OK, I want to move on to the next question because it still ties into what we're talking about here. Um, Stephen Carmichael, another frequent listener. You are awesome. Thanks for listening. Um, asks, why is Final Fantasy 13 so popular considering it was so linear and had an awful combat system compared to past games? So... First of all, I would take a little bit of time to just say I don't think the battle system is awful. Um, I liked parts of it. The game is extremely linear. There's no one that can fight that argument at all. If they are, they're mm-hmm. just, they don't they haven't played the game basically. But there's that one part where it opens up. You yeah. see grass. Yeah, that's a bad part of the game because it drags <laughs> and it's horribly designed. Um yep. So I actually did a little research here because I was curious. You know, we think of it as so popular. So I looked into it. Its lifetime sales are 7.49 million, so about 7.5 million. There are three Final Fantasy games, mainline games, that are above that. So Final Fantasy VIII has 8.7 million sales. Final Fantasy VII has 11.8 million sales. And Final Fantasy X actually has almost 15 million sales, which is like twice as much as thirteen. So even though you think thirteen is popular, if you actually go back and look at the numbers... Older games are more popular if you just go by pure sales, which I think is interesting. The other thing to keep in mind is that even if 13 was popular, if you consider that 7.5-ish million number, look at Final Fantasy 13 2 and Lightning Returns. Final Fantasy 13 2 had 3.5 million, so not even half the sales. And then Lightning Returns has 0.9 million sales. They didn't even break a million. That series quickly declined. And... I think the reason you feel the way you do is because it's the only Final Fantasy mainline game that we've had to latch on to between 2006 and now, except for Final Fantasy XIV, but that's an MMO, so it kind of lives in its own space over there, away from the rest of the series. Final Fantasy XII came out, but we knew XIII was on the way in 2006. XIII came out in 2009, and until now, we still haven't had another game come out. XV isn't even out yet, as of when we're recording this. So I think that... It's literally been like 10 years between single player Final Fantasy releases and it feels like that's the only thing top of mind because it's been the only one to talk about for 10 years. And then you look at the numbers when it comes to that, that all three of the 13 games add up to selling what Final Fantasy 7 did overall. Yeah, I mean, that may be a little unfair, but I think I think looking at the popularity and the sales disparity really does sum it up. And people were really excited about it when it came out. And then once, once they saw what it actually was, you can't really take back video games. And so, you know, you've got those sales. They're not being counted as returns. And they're out there. And then you really see how it goes over the next couple of games. This is something I've learned through indie authors, uh, through being an indie author, that you're looking at a very small read-through rate from book one to book two. You might get 50 or 60% if you're lucky. And then you're still looking if the and if it's free, you're looking at probably 25 to 40. And but if you get people to book two, there's like a 90% read through rate that gets them to the end of the trilogy and further books like that. Oh, so wow. so you're you're looking at Final Fantasy 13 where you're you have a 50% buy-in rate at 132 that's that's pretty normal that's okay where you know you hooked half the people who played it you can still make a pretty good buck doing that when you're looking at it overall but when you look at 3.4 million to 900,000 that is dismal that you didn't hit 50 when you should be hitting roughly 3 million sales on it just to be able to hold up to percentages that that's a very very statistically miserable series that that no one likes it that if you're looking at typical you know moving through a trilogy nobody likes it at all wow and, that's a really cool perspective on it like from i didn't even think about that like the read through or playthrough rate 
It's fascinating. Now, it may not be the same for video games, but that's sure. what I've learned uh, selling my books, that if I hook you on book one, that there's a slightly over half chance of getting you in book two, and it might even be as close to 70% if it's a paid book. If it's free, it goes significantly lower because people just download it. But from books two, three, and four, they go way up, and looking at Lightning Returns, I'm just staring in the notes at 0.9 million, and I just get sad because yeah, I've, bad. Ne- I've never heard anyone talk about it that I know you've played it. I know Austin's played through part of it. And that's all I know. You're the only two people I know who have touched that game. Yeah, and, and I, I bounced haven't. off of it hard. Like, I bounced off that game super hard. I didn't make it more than three hours into it, maybe. Mm. Like, it was bad. And, you know, I have, like, an affiliation with Final Fantasy series. I yeah. love it. Like, I, I try to love all the games when I boot them up, and I just I couldn't do that one. Um, okay, so, Koji... I think that's how you pronounce it on Twitter says, um, I know it's about the games, but a few minutes on the final fantasy movies would be interesting. I can do that. Um, so final fantasy movies, I liked watching advent children once because it was cool CG and there were fight scenes. I Uh think as a movie and as a plot and as an addition to final fantasy seven, it fails. (laughs) Like, in all yeah. other regards, that movie fails except for having some cool CG fight scenes. What do you think about that one? I have seen that movie once, and maybe twice. Let me say that. I've seen it once sitting down to watch it, and it has been in the background a couple more times as I've been doing other things. I cannot tell you what it's about. There are very few movies that make zero sense, and Advent Children is one of them, that I watch it. And I think of myself as a fairly intelligent person. I mean, I'm trained in narrative. I mean, I'm an English teacher and I don't know what's going on. I watch it and I feel stupid because I can't follow it. And I'm like, maybe there's something, somebody is smarter than I am who wrote this. And I just, I I, I want to like it. And I I need to go back and rewatch it because I haven't rewatched it in about 10 years is but at the time i didn't know what was going on and i'd just gone through final fantasy 7 again and so right now i'm just it's not going to make any sense to me right now i'm afraid but i thought it was really pretty i tried to rewatch it after i did my playthrough of 7 for my final fantasy project right and i i couldn't even do it anymore like as an adult trying to watch that movie it's just it's not good um (laughs) final fantasy spirits within i actually thought it was okay at the time it has yeah. some uncanny valley problems if you go back and watch it now. It sure but, does. I mean, the thing about that one is just that it like it almost destroyed the series that we love. It cost them so much money mm-hmm. and it was the project that basically got one of the I, I always forget if he's like a game director or producer, one of the main Final Fantasy guys who has made some of the ones that you love. I wanna say he was maybe in charge of seven. Um okay. was in charge of this movie. And because it was a complete flop, he basically got pushed out of doing like any more big projects. Like he, I think he still works there, but it's in, you know, Japan culture. You don't fire people. You just put them in an office in the corner out of the way so that, you know, they get a salary, but they don't actually like participate anymore. That's what happened to him because of this movie. I didn't know that. Yeah, I should have done a little research and reminded myself of who it was and which games he was part of, but it's something like that, if I'm remembering the narrative correctly. So the movie itself was okay, I suppose. It's okay. I've I've gone back and watched it more than any of the others, and which is not saying a lot because Kingsglaive, as of this recording, is less than a week old, and... I liked always going back and rewatching it. Yeah, the CGI is not very good at this point. Like you can definitely tell it's dated that that it is very old now, but I liked it. It's it's fine. It's not special and nothing about it screams Final Fantasy to me. That was always my biggest qualm with it. I was wanting a big epic Final Fantasy and I didn't get any of the set dressing I wanted. The story tried to be there, but I didn't I didn't see any of the stuff I wanted to. Yeah, there's like no fan service in that game and it's or in that movie. It it just misses the mark in being a Final Fantasy. Like you could take Final Fantasy off the name of that movie and it wouldn't change anything about anything. it. Like you wouldn't even notice, which is sad. Um and then Kingsglaive 
again, we're not going to spoil it because we both watched it, but it's very, very new and most people haven't. Um, I think it's easily the best Final Fantasy movie. I really, easily. Yeah, I really liked the context that it gave me so that I understand the world of Final Fantasy 15 better. And it actually has made me more excited to get into the game than I already was. And I didn't know anything about Final Fantasy 15 going in. In terms of the world and story, I knew very basic things like there's a king and there's an empire was basically all I knew. So going in, and I didn't play the demos or anything like that, and I know you said that you had played the demo, the the episode Duske, I think, or however yeah, it's pronounced. Yeah, I played both and demos. So, so I haven't played any of those. So I go into Kingsglaive knowing only what I know from the first two Brotherhood animes. And I loved it. Like, I watched the first half of it, I guess, maybe the first 20 minutes, and I'm thinking this is going to be an Advent Children issue where things are happening and they're using words that I don't actually know what they mean. They're referring to places and stuff, and I'm just like, okay, like, this is pretty. They're doing some good things. I see that there are characters in this one, but I didn't really latch on. And then... Uh, they started tying it all together after just a few minutes maybe 20 minutes or so i started seeing how everything was connected i started seeing what the characters were doing and what they were like and i went all in this i'm so looking forward to final fantasy 15 because of this movie by the time it ended i wanted to play final fantasy 15 so badly it was absurd that kingsglaive i thought they did wonderful things and if any of the things that they do in the second half of that movie show up in the game i'm gonna be a real happy boy (laughs) that's good so yeah, I, I would recommend Kingsglaive to anybody who's interested even remotely in the Final Fantasy movies or 15. I think it's worth your time to see at least once. I've watched it once so far. I'm probably going right. to watch it at least one more time before the game comes out. Yep. And I mean, and it feels like a Final Fantasy movie. That's the thing. It doesn't have a whole lot of fan service to it. There are a couple of Chocobo references. There are things like that. But nothing just out and out, not like the Warcraft movie with fan service where you just have it, you know, them with a murloc crossing a bridge or something. As they're crossing a bridge, there's a murloc, anything like that. But there's enough that it feels like a Final Fantasy movie. And that was that was refreshing after thinking back to Spirits Within. Yeah, it was I didn't know how they would do. They got the feeling right, which is very important. Um, And then Destin Lee gives us our last question, which is basically an impossible question. Which Final (laughs) Fantasy game is the best experience? And, you know, um, it depends on your mood, I guess. Yeah. Like, Final Fantasy IX is my favorite, right? But it doesn't mean that it's the best experience. And it's not necessarily the one that i'm always going to reach for if i want a final fantasy game it depends what i'm in the mood for um what i'm willing to put up with sometimes in terms of going back to the (laughs) old games uh what kind of story i want what kind of battle system i want you know which platform i feel like playing it on like i can't answer this question because it totally depends on my mood and how busy i am and what i feel like doing you know like nine is my favorite but it's not the one that i'm always going to go for yeah i've I feel the same way about nine. I've been thinking about this since I saw it on Twitter and this thinking about the best experience, like thinking back in terms of nostalgia and the way that I felt about them looking back and the way that I feel about them looking back. Seven was the best experience for me because of the things that were going on in gaming at that time where I was in my life at that time. Uh, I talk about that one in the JRPG episode a few weeks back, and that one is the best experience because it's the best personal experience to me. But somebody else will have had that experience with the original Final Fantasy. I mean, somebody else is having that experience right now with Final Fantasy XIV when they're experiencing beating their the final boss of the raid for the very first time, probably as we're recording this somewhere in the world. I mean, it just entirely depends. It's so subjective that if you're... It depends on what you're looking for. But, I mean, I want to ask you a question based on this. If you're just thinking of Final Fantasy and you're just going to grab one and pick it up and play it, like, what is the one that you automatically think of when somebody says, let's play Final Fantasy or you should play a Final Fantasy game? What's the one that you default to? And I think that may be kind of a, a... 
an adjacent tangent here that that could answer this so for me like which game do i personally go for yeah like defaulting to is like hey you're playing a final fantasy game what would that be nine it would probably be nine nine yeah and for me it's six six is always the one that i default to okay Uh, that's interesting so but even though seven's the one I have the greatest personal nine is my favorite and seven's the one I have more of an emotional attachment to because of my life, I still default to six as being the final fantasy. Sure. And I think like emotionally, I probably feel the most attached to like eight and 10, but those aren't the ones yeah. I would default go for. I would default for nine. Like if I just, you know, final fantasy, what game like nine pops into my mind. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's interesting to me because I, it's my favorite, but it's not mine. So, yay. Yeah. But I guess, Destin, that's the best we can do. We tried. <laughs> yeah, we tried. Hopefully uh, that helps. Okay, so one more kind of piece of business here before we get into Weekly Geekery. We want to know what you guys want to hear more about. I mean, after getting all of this awesome feedback and actually hearing back from you when we asked for questions and responses and stuff, um, we're kind of looking at what are you guys interested in for future potential podcasts? I mean, if you've listened to us up through now and you've listened to our backlog, you kind of know what we're into, right? If you throw us something that we don't care about at all, we're not going to do that just because you ask. But if it's something along the lines of things we like, and you guys are really passionate about it, we would love to talk about it. So send that kind of thing our way. We're probably going to end up doing a Squaresoft Games podcast and just talk about our fuzzy memories of all of these Squaresoft games from like Super (laughs) Nintendo and PlayStation era, basically. Uh, We'll probably have to do a Chrono Trigger episode separate from that because Chrono Trigger deserves its own episode. If there's any particular Final Fantasy game after all of this talking the last three weeks... If there's one that you want us to do a deep dive into and cover, we might do that. We're willing to do it for certain ones. Um, yes. Especially... If you say Final Fantasy 3, then no. No, no, That's no, a no. hard, hard no. But if <laughs> if you say, if a lot of you are interested in 9 or 6, we might do another replay as a community and then talk about it because we like those games a lot. Let us know if you're interested in those. And then... As a bigger thought beyond this, we're also thinking about doing a game club in the future. Um, We've talked about just kind of like things we can do to like change up the podcast a little. And this would not be a monthly game club. It wouldn't be something that's always ongoing. What's the next game? Everyone has to, you know, keep working at it. It would be slower than that, right? We don't want to devote that much time. We're adults. We have other things going on. It would probably be more for every once in a while when we feel like it and we have the time, we'll go, okay, we're going to beat this game over the next two or three weeks, everybody, and then we're going to do one episode about it. But it wouldn't constantly be a game in the background you have to worry about. But if you're interested in something like that, let us know. And for games like that, we have been thinking about it. We're thinking about things that have maybe been out for longer, that people can get on more platforms, or it could be something newer if it's very easy to get into or get a hold of. Especially if there's a game that's easy to get into for non-gamers, that would be really interesting. Uh, We were thinking about maybe even 80 Days as a possibility for the first one, because 80 Days is a quick game to play through, and it's out on like every system out there, and anyone gamer or non-gamer can appreciate it and then i mean we can always do a final fantasy game that way but it's got you know it has more of an investment of time in it as opposed to one of the mobile games even a final fantasy mobile game things like that where what would you guys be interested in yeah and then you were you were talking about maybe doing some kind of twitter chat too yeah i love the idea of a twitter chat to where we all just get together once a week and we talk about things where whether it's tied to the podcast we do a you know welcome to hashtag geek to geek and today we're talking about final fantasy that kind of thing tied to the uh for an hour where we send out topics to discuss uh, a lot of you guys may be familiar with the twitter chat format or it could be tied into into the game that we play together where we get together and kind of discuss it week to week before we do a cast about it. Would you guys be interested in setting aside an hour each week and doing a Twitter chat? Is that something that you as a community would be interested with or interested in to talk to and be involved with us more that way? So let us know. Yeah. So we just thought at the end of this first like listener feedback episode, we thought we would get all these things out there that have been percolating in our heads for a while. So send us any responses, any thoughts, anything you're super passionate about that you want us to talk more about. Twitter is always the best way, which we usually say every week. But, you know, the the email address works, too. There are multiple ways to get a hold of us. 
Okay, enough of that business. Um, weekly Geekery. It's time for Weekly Geekery. If you don't know what that is, it's where we share what we've been geeking out about this week. What do you got this week? Um, this week, I actually started a book. I'm really proud of myself. I haven't read in a very long time and uh, I haven't just been able to focus. And I started United States of Japan by Peter Tyrius. I'm not sure how to say it. It's an alternate history sci-fi book that... If obviously, if Japan had won against America in World War II, and it's really interesting because it's gaming centric, that the protagonist where I am right now works for the Japanese government in the game censorship division and he is involved in basically making sure that there's nothing that's anti-government in games on basically mobile on cell phone games and also tracking people's choices in narrative games to see if there's any kind of seditious thought and i think it's really interesting and it basically runs under the that's the bait that's where i am in terms of the story right now but it runs under the premise of instead of having an atomic weapon that was used against them basically Basically, Japan had the atomic weapon and they came for San Francisco, I believe, in giant mechs instead of having bombers. So the cover is an anime mech in uh, in a city. And I'm super looking forward to seeing that in a novel. What's the uh, what's the time period? Like, is it anything like Man in the High Castle or is it more modern? It times? Is. It's actually very similar to Man in the High Castle. That was what got me interested is that it starts out in like 1942, I believe, okay. sometime around there. And then. And where I am right now is 1988. Oh. And what's really interesting about it is that technology has moved so much faster that in 1988, they're using what's called portacals, which are portable calculators, which are just cell phones. They're just iPhones at this point. <laughs> and so it's supposed to be in 1988 to show the difference in technology if uh, Japan were basically in charge of the tech industry in the world. It's super interesting. And it's like the, the quashing, like in Man in the High Castle of America, American culture and vilifying those kinds of people and kind of making making Americans the subservient class as opposed to uh, the way that that Americans were looking at people of other other nationalities after World War II with the post-war you know racism honestly so it was it's a very very interesting book and right now I don't know how it stays that way the paperbacks around ten dollars but I was able to pick up the Kindle and Audible version that with whisper sync i got them for five dollars when they were on sale but right now the kindle and audible version together run about nine dollars on amazon so i mean it's cool i really am i'm like into this book right now if you can't tell cool like and uh, i've also watched indie game life after that have have you seen indie game have you seen the first one yeah, I did. Okay, I really liked Indie Game. I watched it, and it made me really want to be like, be creative and make something after that. And Indie Game Life After it really is a follow up game to it, or follow up movie to that one. And it adds in some new people, and it just basically checks up on the creators of Fez and. Uh, Super Meat Boy and the illustrator for Braid and then adds in a bunch of other people talking about the guy from Spelunky is in there and has a section and that kind of thing. And it made me go play Spelunky because he's such a nice guy. It's like, I want to support that guy. I want to play his game. And so Indie Game Life After was well worth the couple of hours that I spent on it. It's uh, it's good, especially if you've seen the first one. You won't make It won't make any sense if you haven't seen the first one. Yeah, I should probably check it out because I have seen the first one and it was interesting. It actually kind of does ties, have language. Oh, it actually kind of ties into mine because I actually just read the Spelunky book from Boss Fight Books. Yeah. If you guys don't know, Boss Fight Books is like this little indie publisher. You can pick them up on Amazon on Kindle, which is what I usually do, or you can buy them direct from the publisher as like a printed paperback. But mm-hmm. they basically dive into mostly older games. I don't think there's many modern or more modern games in there. But it's I think like, there's a couple, but not there, many. There might be a couple. But it's like one person writing in depth about one game in kind of often it's like an essay format or like a chapter format. So I've read a couple of them. My favorite was the Chrono Trigger one, but this Spelunky one is second for sure. It's it's basically like this one is written by the guy who was the programmer for Spelunky. And he talks about the journey through making the game and his thought process behind designing a lot of the game. And now after reading it, I really want to go back and play the game 
again because now I've kind of seen behind the curtain and I want to yeah. see I want to see the game itself with fresh eyes after that. So yeah, boss fight books is cool. Check out the Spelunky one and check out the Chrono Trigger one if you if it sounds interesting to you at all because I like that one a lot. That's my number one. Um, the other thing this week I was kind of contemplating going back to MMOs. I, I wasn't yeah. sure, and the thing was that like. I've talked about this the last few weeks. I'm at the I'm at the end of my gaming backlog and I'm just waiting for these fall releases to come out as I'm demoing basically Gamefly games and just looking for something to do besides my evergreen games. And MMOs, I thought, maybe, maybe. And <laughs> Beige reminded me that a bunch of the ones that I have played in the past now have free-to-play versions, so I could just try that and jog my memory before I paid any money. So I did that with a few different games, the highlights of which were WoW, because the WoW expansion just came out, like, yeah. not that long ago. And um, all my friends online are talking about it, and everyone says it's the mm-hmm. best WoW expansion ever. I went back, and I did, like, the free-to-play, started a new character, did the first 15 levels or so, and was reminded that wow is wow and i've played yep. enough of that in my life and i don't it, it's not doing anything new like it's the same game i'm okay still a good game it is and and we're not it, knocking it because i feel the exact same way because i've done the starter stuff and gotten up to about that same level before i had pretty much the same revelation that you did like i've played this before and I just move on that that there's nothing wrong with it and i'm so happy that other people are still enjoying it but I've played my fill of that, I think. Yes, that's how I feel too. So I was glad that that free-to-play exists now because I jogged my memory enough to know that I did not want to spend the money on the expansion and the game time. Then I jumped over to Star Wars, The Old Republic. People told me that I probably picked a bad class for myself the first time I tried it because people who know me are like, oh, you would like the Jedi Knight story so much more. So I went. What did you play first? I played Bounty Hunter and then I played Sith something whatever the warrior type sith guy is okay it's sith warrior good job oh oh nice yay yay for me <laughs> and then i want to say that I, I created a couple others just to see like low level abilities but I, I didn't really play anybody else so this time i went back i made a jedi i played about 15 levels again just like wow and i got bored like it was yeah. it was better it was definitely better but i didn't make it very far i think like every time i played mmo now it just feels like the MMO ness of it waters down the part of the game that I like, and it would be a better game single player. I I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be an MMO that comes along that's for me again, and that that's... deserves its own episode. We are due to do an MMO episode sometime. Yeah, because we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours because I've pretty much gotten the same way where when I'm trying out different MMOs that I feel that I would much rather have this world in a single player game just to be able to take in on my own time because I get so competitive and addicted that if I don't have the very best equipment, I don't have this, that I start comparing myself to all of these other players and that mindset kicks in. And with single player games, it doesn't. I don't have to have all of the final fantasy ultimate weapons but i'd better have that raid weapon in world of warcraft and i don't feel like that i feel more like everything i do is completely and utterly pointless because there's millions of other people doing the exact same thing and it's like oh wow so we are complete opposites on that one is like yeah yeah that's what i felt for a long time about single player games but yeah different podcast we are due for an mmo episode soon because i'm i'm not negative on mmos as a genre Mm -mm. i have so many good memories of my first probably like three or four mmos that i played maybe even five or six i have lots of good mmo memories i'm just at the point now where it's like i want there to be an evolution of the genre so i can get back into it and i i it just hasn't showed up yet yeah and that's that's that is really the way that i feel with it too going back i mean you still may want to play wildstar that you I don't think you gave that a shot this week that it's fun it's different but I don't think it's going to be different enough for you but the battle system's fun for a few levels to be able to hop around and it's way more actiony same for the Elder Scrolls Online I want you to like Elder Scrolls Online but I'm super afraid you're going to be really judgy because it's not as good as the Skyrims and Oblivions out there that is most assuredly exactly what would happen so (laughs) With that in mind, maybe yep. maybe next week will be the MMO episode. We'll have to see what else is going on next week. Maybe we're due for it. That's Monday. true. That's a good idea. Um, Apparently, since we got onto a like 
10 minute tangent about it during weekly geekery maybe we should what do you guys yeah. think yeah yeah you can write to us with comments suggestions or feedback as always our email address is geek to geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on twitter at geek to geekcast and if you want to get email updates about any of our network's podcasts, just go to geek2geekcast.net and tell us what shows you want updates about. I blog almost daily at agreenmushroom.com, and you can find me at grnmushroom. That's green mushroom without the E's on Twitter. Um, I've also been running the Video Game News Now podcast, but that is actually, ooh, news here. That is going to go on hold for a bit. With fall starting up and my kids in school and work the way it is, I want to put that on hold dedicate more time to the geek to geek podcast and maybe some of that stuff we talked about today like game club or expanded stuff on twitter or just diving in deeper on certain topics that might require research so i'm going to double down some of my effort on geek to geek and i would love for video game news now to come back later and kind of have a new format where we cover the news but then also have a co-host where we can talk about the news of the week and what it means and what to pay attention to and what we're excited about. I think there's a different format in there that's going to work better. I just don't have the time for it yet. So video game news now is paused for the moment, but I hope to bring it back sometime in the future. That was a bit of a tangent. But I think that when it comes back, it's going to be like, honestly, bigger and better than ever, you know, to, to really use a cliche like that. But but I really think that you have some good ideas. I, I look forward to hearing it with a co-host. Thank you. We'll see. We'll see when that'll work out. I, I, hopefully it will. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beach. That's Beach with two E's. And I host the Geek Fitness Health Hacks podcast, which is on its way back, you guys. I've gotten your messages and I am finally out of my anxiety medication funk and my brain's working again so i will be able to get that if it's not back right now when you listen to this it will be very 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 soon so watch your feeds or check geekfitness.net uh thank you guys for pushing me on that by the way i really appreciate all your messages telling me to uh to give you the podcast and that i help you out so so really thank you from the bottom of my heart and if you want even more of me check out my science fiction and steampunk novels at bjkeaton.com hashtag Shameless plug. We've been Void and Beige with your Geek to Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. 